I find one of the more amusing arguments of people who are skeptical about the inspirational nature of the scriptures, we maybe we can call them word of God deniers in today's rhetoric, but they will say that the Bible is just a piece of literature. And to a certain degree, they're right. Of course, we see it as more than that. We see it as the word of God speaking to us, but it is a piece of literature. It's language put down in written form. But it's not just a piece of literature, it's a whole collection of multiple forms of literature, multiple books brought together in this one volume <clears throat> that we recognize as God's Word. And within it are all different types of literature that can be imagined. <clears throat> For example, the class that I'm giving now through my via Zoom, accessible through my website on Wednesdays, is a course on apocalyptic literature, the apocalyptic style of literature, and the two books in the Bible that make use of that style, the books of Daniel and Revelation. But there are other forms of literature in the Bible. There are histories, maybe not the kind of histories that we're used to in our modern understanding of history, but nonetheless, stories of God's holy people, Israel, as much as the stories of the apostles in the early decades of the church's history, and even the life of Christ. There are legal codes, the law of Moses. There's letters and correspondence in the epistles of the New Testament. There's prophetic literature that is the product of the prophetic activity of Israel, as well as wisdom literature, both of which incorporate other forms of writing within those styles of literature itself. We see in the Psalms examples of songs, prayer, and poetry a whole treasure trove of different types of literature that work its way to development into what we recognize and celebrate as the Word of God. And when was the last time you heard a homily that used the responsorial psalm as its springboard? Today's responsorial psalm, The Lord Hears the Cry of the Poor, is taken from Psalm 34, which inspires the well-known liturgical hymn, The Lord Hears the Cry of the Poor, Blessed Be the Lord, is based upon Psalm 34. But Psalm 34 isn't just any type of psalm. It's of a collection of psalms within the book of psalms that is known as acrostic poetry, or perhaps better understood, alphabet poetry. You might say, well, what other way are we going to use? We write with alphabets. But in acrostic poetry, it's a rather ingenious style of poetry because in each line of the poem, we see a successive progression of the letters of the alphabet. And in the case of Psalm 34 and others like it, each verse begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The first word of the first line begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The second line with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It would be as if, if we were to write an acrostic poem in English, the first line would begin with a word starting with the letter A. The second line, which could be in the middle of a sentence, but it goes to the second line and flows perfectly, would begin with a word starting with the letter B. The third line would begin with a word starting with the letter C, and it would go on for 26 lines, or a, a division or multiplication of 26. It could be 13 lines, and then each half line begins with a letter of the alphabet in its progression. And in Hebrew, Psalm 34 is one of those acrostic psalms, as well known as the song has made this particular psalm. This is only one of about five or six psalms in the Bible and a few portions of the prophets that present its poetic utterances in this way. Psalm 111 is another such acrostic psalm. But I suppose the acrostic psalm to end all acrostic psalms would be Psalm 119, which goes on for over 170 verses. And it's an acrostic hymn. Although it's not one in which each line progressively begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But go home and look at your Bibles and look up Psalm 119. You'll see the whole psalm is divided into various sections that are named for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. 
And in each of those sections, every line begins with that particular letter of the Hebrew alphabet before going on to the next section in which every line is begins with a word starting with the next Hebrew letter. And it goes on for over 170 verses. And it shows us that, yes, the Bible is literature, but it was also written by very skilled writers, poets, prophets, historians, geniuses, literary geniuses have put together these writings. And we see God's inspiration as a part of that great skill that these writers had. But it also shows that not only did they have a reverence for the word of God and the message of God, but they had a reverence for the very language that God was using to communicate that word. And not just the language, but even the letters of the alphabet of that language. This is the language, these are the words, and these are the letters that God had chosen to communicate his word to his holy people. Now eventually, after the conquest of Alexander the Great, and the great diaspora of Jewish scholars to Alexandria in Egypt, where there was the great library and that great center of learning and Greek culture, the Old Testament would eventually be translated into Greek, And, of course, that acrostic nature of these poems is lost in translation as we would lose it in the English translation. But eventually, the New Testament would be written in its original language in the Greek language. The Gospels, the Epistles, even the Book of Revelation were originally written in Greek. And even on occasion, the Greek language is built upon and honored in a way as part of the communication of God's word in those writings, not the least of which is in the book of Revelation, in three places, God and then eventually Jesus, the lamb that was slain, utter the phrase, I am the alpha and the omega. Hopefully we know what that means. Alpha and omega are the first and last letters of of the Greek language. It would be as if in English they were to say, I am the A and the Z. But in speaking of the Alpha and the Omega, they say, I am the first and the last, the beginning of all things and the end of all things. And the Greek alphabet is incorporated as a symbol of the eternal nature of God, the source of all creation and the end of all things. Not only the words, but the language and even the alphabet of that language is honored and reverenced. Now, of course, over time, the scriptures and our worship has been translated into countless languages throughout the world. And these are the words in which God has chosen to communicate his word and which we return in our worship to God. Many people might ask themselves, well, what is God's language? What is the language of God? And depending on who you ask, you might get someone who says, well, of course, God's language is Latin, the traditional language of God. But then you'd have to go back a little further and realize that before we were ever a Latin church, we were a Greek-speaking church. But even before that, God spoke his word to his holy people in Hebrew, So what is the language of God? Well, it's very clear. The language of God is whatever language God has chosen to communicate his word to his people and with which we give worship to God. And today, here in the United States, in the state of California, in the city of Mill Valley of the Bay Area, in the parish of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, God's language is English, as this is the language God is communicating his word to us and with which we are giving worship to God. And of course, there are many other languages throughout the world, many of which are spoken perhaps by people here in this church in addition to English. And God uses those languages as well. But for us here today, at least, he uses English. Let's ponder that for a moment using our language to preach, speak his word, and we respond 
in that same language in giving worship to God. Ours is the language of Shakespeare, Milton, George Herbert, John Donne, Gerard Manley Hopkins. Ours is the language of James Fenimore Cooper and Charles Dickens, of Toni Morrison, J.K. Rowling, J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, Arthur Conan Doyle, Harper Lee, William Golding, and so many others. Ours is the language of Queen Elizabeth I up to Queen Elizabeth II and the language of Winston Churchill. Ours is the language in which our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, and Bill of Rights were written, three of the greatest documents in human history. Ours is the language of George Washington, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt. Ours is the language of Vin Scully, Harry Carey, Rush Limbaugh, Larry King, Paul Harvey, Garrison Keillor, and Archbishop Fulton Sheen. And this is the language that God is now communicating to us, his word, and we are responding in this worship. In the words of another great English writer, George Bernard Shaw, in his play Pygmalion, and of course the subsequent musical My Fair Lady, Henry Higgins speaks of the glories of the English language to his student Eliza Doolittle, and he says, The majesty and grandeur of the English language is the greatest possession we have. The noblest thoughts that ever flowed through the hearts of men are contained in its extraordinary, imaginative, and musical mixture of sounds. And this is the language that God now communicates to us. We have the cleverness of the ancient Hebrew language in Psalms such as 34, but we have the eloquence with which the English language has been used to preach and communicate the Word of God and in the songs and prayers in which we respond in our worship of God. Of course, today we do have various elements and factions who seek to diminish the importance of language, to neutralize or make petty the definition of words in order to affect a culture in which language is what brings us together and unites us in a common understanding of these symbols, phrases, and words. But let us have a particular reverence for our language, the language in which on this day God has chosen to speak to us. Let us remember that in our language we have symbols and words and phrases that have meaning, that mean something, that express with great eloquence some of the greatest thoughts in human history, as well as the deepness of faith that we profess today. And let us, as the people of the ancient Hebrew, Hebrew world did, and the ancient Greek world did, have a reverence for our language. This is the language on this day that God has chosen to communicate to us here in this church. Let us with reverence respond in that same language but also give thanks to God for giving us that gift of language, the languages that are spoken throughout the world, the language in which we are able to communicate with meaning, words, phrases, and the essence of our faith, and a language which on this day God communicates to us his holy word, and we respond to him in our worship. <laughs> 